morning, OBC family, and thanks for choosing to be with us this morning. Uh, hard to believe, but we've officially turned the page on 2020, and now we're looking forward in 2021. But uh, thanks for being a part of this journey. And uh, I know that we're all looking forward to the day, and maybe it's not that far down the road when we're able to actually meet under the same roof again. But uh, until then, uh, we just appreciate your support and encouragement and uh, tuning into these online services. Uh, I'm excited today because we're starting a brand new message series working through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And if you're at all familiar with those three chapters in Matthew, you know that uh, it contains some of Jesus' most powerful teachings. And uh, we're going to start a journey together as we look through those powerful three chapters. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to have them ready. Uh, we're going to be uh, working through a bit of an overview of, of Matthew's Gospel as well as an overview of the Sermon on the Mount today as well. So uh, have your Bibles opened and ready. Uh, we also want to let you know that uh, on the email that was sent out, uh, we have some activity sheets for the kids. So if parents, you can uh, pause this and go download those if you should choose. But uh, as we get started, I'm going to invite um, Lassa and Meredith to lead us in some worship this morning. Mm -hmm. 
crowds of people followed Jesus wherever he went. One day, Jesus went up on a mountain. He sat down and began to teach about the kingdom of God. First, Jesus taught about the blessings that come to those who follow him. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Then Jesus taught how believers should live. Jesus said that believers are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see the good things you do and choose to praise God. Then Jesus taught about God's law. Jesus did not come to get rid of the law, but to obey it perfectly. He said that to enter heaven, a person can't just look righteous on the outside like the righteous leaders. A person must be righteous on the inside too, obeying God for the right reasons. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for them. When you give to people who are poor, give in secret. And when you pray, don't pray just so that people will hear you. Jesus taught the people how to pray. He also said, forgive others. If you forgive those who sin against you, God will forgive you too. But if you don't forgive them, God will not forgive you. Jesus said, do not collect treasures on earth. They can be destroyed or, or stolen. Collect treasures in heaven instead. For where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be also. He taught that God provides for his people. Jesus taught the people many things. When he finished teaching, the crowds were amazed because he taught them like one who had authority. Jesus taught people what it means to follow him. He taught how people should live, how they should treat one another, and how to love God. People who trust in Jesus live to honor God and show what his kingdom is like. this morning to be starting a, a new message series through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And if you are at all familiar with those three chapters in Matthew, then you know that they contain some of Jesus' most memorable and powerful teachings. But before we jump into those chapters, it's extremely important that we understand some things about the Gospel of Matthew. Although the author of the first Gospel never identifies himself in his writings, the early church fathers were unanimous in their understanding that Matthew, one of the 12 apostles, was in fact the author. 
If you remember Matthew, whose name means a gift of the Lord, well, he was a tax collector who literally dropped everything one day to follow Jesus. And this is the same disciple who's referred to as Levi in the Gospels of Mark and Luke. Most people also believe that Matthew's Gospel was written in the early church period, possibly in the early part of 50 AD when the church was largely Jewish and this new Gospel was being preached exclusively to the nation of Israel. And that becomes a, a very important part of our unpacking of this book because it's obvious as you read Matthew's account of Jesus' life that it was written primarily for a Jewish reader. And why would, why would we say that? Well, Matthew focuses on Jesus being the fulfillment of the Old Testament messianic prophecies where the other Gospels don't. Matthew has more Old Testament quotes than any other New Testament book. At the beginning of the book of Matthew, he painstakingly traces the lineage of Jesus all the way back to Abraham, something that really only the Jewish people would care about. Matthew also talks about all kinds of different Jewish customs and traditions, and yet he never feels the need to explain what they are like the other Gospels do, because the assumption is that the readers already know about them. But my point in telling you this is that people reading this account of Jesus' life were already saturated with Jewish thought and rituals and customs. So why is that important that we understand this before looking at the Sermon on the Mount? Well, it's important because this, this whole sermon was documented as a way of announcing to the nation of Israel that God was in the process of shifting history. Let me explain what I mean by that. The Sermon on the Mount is likely one of the most disturbing writings in all of the New Testament. And especially if you were part of the Jewish faith, Jesus is, in many ways, dismantling some of their most held-to beliefs. And Jesus didn't pull any punches. I mean, in this collection of his most famous teachings, Jesus lays out in black and white what it means to be a follower of his. And so much of what he talks about in this sermon is also speaking against what the Jewish faith at this time had really become. In fact, that's part of what makes this such an important writing for all of us as well. I mean, whether you're watching this and you're a Christian, whether you're a pre-Christian, whether you're still trying to figure this whole faith thing out, you can't read these three chapters without having a, a precise picture as to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I mean, just think about what he's what's contained in these three chapters. I mean, you've got the golden rule, love your enemy as yourself. You have the Lord's Prayer. You have teachings on loving your enemies. You have teachings on storing up your treasures in heaven and not on earth. You have teachings on what it means to be the salt and light. And I could go on and on. But for us, I also think there's a danger in studying this Sermon on the Mount because these teachings of Jesus, they've become so familiar to us that I think sometimes they actually lose their power. And that happens because we grow immune to the shock that this actually would have caused to the readers of it back then. There was a Jewish rabbi who uh, not that long ago wrote a, a very short book on the Sermon on the Mount. And in his introduction, he has this classic quote where he says, essentially, the history of Christianity is a history of Christians trying to evade the Sermon on the Mount and avoid living according to its plain meaning. Do you think that that could be true? What I'm hoping that we're all going to come to understand as we study these chapters together is that when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he was introducing the nation of Israel to a change, to a shift that was taking place. And to understand this shift, I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the final verses of the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter 7. Now, I know what you're saying. Uh, it might seem odd that we're starting this sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount by looking at the final verses in chapter 7 rather than the first verses in chapter 5. But hang in there with me because I think this is going to make a lot of sense. Because what's especially fascinating about these closing verses is that they record how people responded to Jesus' message. And it's very revealing. So Matthew 7, verses 28 and 29, they read like this. 
When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. And that word amazed in this passage is such an interesting word in the original Greek. Some of your translations might translate that word as meaning astonished or astounded. And our English translation can be a little bit problematic for that word because in our language, we've minimized the severity of that word. I mean, we can say that pizza was amazing or that movie that we watched last night was amazing. That book that I'm reading is amazing. Or as I often say to Monica, that meal that you made last night, it was amazing. And in a lot of ways, our language has turned this word into something that is weaker than is actually being communicated in this passage. This passage is in fact telling us that those listening to this message, when it was all said and done, that they were taken back, that they were floored, that they were shocked, that they were, they were dumbfounded by what they had heard. And if you look up this word amazed in most Greek dictionaries, you will see that it means out of your mind. So understand that after these people had heard Jesus teach, they were astounded. They were left speechless. And why? Because Jesus was speaking to them about something that they had never heard or considered before. Jesus spoke and what he told them literally translated, it blew their minds. And they didn't have a category for the kinds of things that his teachings were raising inside of him. I mean, it bothered them. It impressed them. And they learned and they were deeply, deeply challenged by what they had heard. And what challenged them, according to this passage, what challenged them so much seemed to relate more to Jesus' authority and his authority in relationship to Israel's law. Now, when you see the word law as it's found in verse 29, the listeners would have been thinking about Jewish history here. The Greek word for law gets its root word from the Hebrew word Torah, which is also a reference to the first five books of the Bible. What we as Christians call Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, well, in the Jewish tradition, they call that the Torah. And the Torah contains uh, really the story of the nation of Israel, but it also contains the Jewish laws. And there's a bunch of commands that God gives to Israel in these books, the most familiar of which are the first 10. And that, but that's really just the beginning. And get this, there's another 603 commands in those first five books alone. And in Jesus' day, this was considered to be the definitive statement of God to his people about how they were to live and how they were to survive living in community together. And again, what's so interesting about these 613 commands is that they're all focused on God's chosen people's outward behavior. And then something happened. Then Jesus enters the scene and he starts announcing in the Sermon on the Mount that God's kingdom is here and he's reinterpreting the Torah and he's adding to the Torah and he's clarifying the Torah. And frankly, people didn't know what to do with this. In fact, going back to the passage, we're told that his teachings were blowing people's minds because, again, they didn't have any kind of categories to put this kind of teaching into. And Jesus was speaking about all kinds of different things, and he was speaking about it with authority. And then Jesus, in chapter 5, verse 17, he says this, he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. He says, I have not come to abolish the 613 laws, but I've come to fulfill them. And the people's minds are blown by this because he's not just saying this, but he's saying it with, with a supernatural kind of authority that they were picking up on. And he goes on to say, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And Jesus is doing something significant here that we miss out on. But the devout Jews that were listening to it, they know what Jesus is saying. They're not missing it. They were likely saying to themselves, what do you mean our righteousness needs to surpass that of the Pharisees? It's those people's full-time job to follow the laws. It's their job to model for us how the Old Testament Torah says that we need to be outwardly behaving. We look to them to show us what is pleasing to God and what it means to outwardly act according to his laws. And in this passage, Jesus is saying, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. They were likely thinking to themselves, well then, who can enter the kingdom of God? And the thing that I, I really don't want us to miss here was that their struggle was real. And they didn't know what to do with what Jesus was saying because all throughout the 613 commands in the Torah, the ultimate goal was really compliance. The ultimate goal was obedience. The ultimate goal was for people to be behaving correctly. The goal was to have people following the rules and people to be walking the line and not deviate from that line. The goal was for people to act the way that they were told to act. And frankly, the Pharisees, well, they were the experts at that. But now Jesus was fulfilling the reason that those laws were first established. And here he is in this sermon, and he's reinterpreting the Torah. He's adding to the Torah. He's clarifying the Torah. And he starts announcing to the people that God's new kingdom is now here, that a shift is taking place. And with this new kingdom, there comes this new teaching. And that new teaching is that it's no longer simply about doing all the right things. It's no longer simply about saying all the right things. It's no longer simply about going through the motions. And it's no longer simply about making it all look good from the outside. Jesus now says that the kingdom of God has a brand new standard. And I love how Tim Mackey from the Bible Project talks about this. He uses the illustration of an iceberg, and this is what he says. He says, when you look at an iceberg, the mass on the surface is not always an indication of what exists below the ocean. And I think this is what fascinates humans with icebergs. This disparity between what you can see above and what is below is a contrast between what you can see with your eyes and the reality that exists underneath the surface. He goes on to say, in many ways, this seems to capture Jesus' view of human nature and his view of human behavior. And when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is exposing the things that are happening under the surface of our behaviors, we start to feel uncomfortable. And part of what Jesus is trying to help people understand about this new kingdom and this shift that was taking place was that it was no longer going to be about people's outward behavior was now going to be about what was happening under the surface. It was no longer going to be about what everyone else could see. It was now going to be about those things that at times only God can see. This new kingdom was going to have less to do with doing and saying all the ritualistic right things. It was now going to be about what was happening inside people's hearts. And again, we're told that this new idea, this new thought this new teaching, it blew people's minds. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he was discerning what was really happening underneath people's behavior. Jesus is kind of saying that God no longer is focusing on the outward behavior, but now what he really cares about is what is motivating you. Why do you do what you do? What drives you? What do you value? What do you treasure most? What are your deep level motivations and values that are just underneath the surface, driving your behaviors? What is it that makes you tick? And what you hear throughout this incredible three chapters of Jesus' teaching is that in this new kingdom, Jesus is not satisfied with simply forming yet another community of people who are just about behavior modification. 
Jesus is here to address the real issues and the real problems with the human condition. And Jesus is here to expose sin, which is why reading the Sermon on the Mount can at times be incredibly painful. But the great news is that Jesus also moves us towards the ultimate solution. Jesus is saying that I haven't come to abolish the Torah or the set of 613 laws. Rather, I've come to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the Torah until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these 613 commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever practices, lives out, actively teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, unless the quality of your relationships surpass that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, unless the integrity with which you follow God and behave in your relationships surpasses the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, unless all that surpasses the most religious people that you can possibly even dream of or imagine, there's no way that you can enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's a tough teaching. And he says all this with such power and authority. Again, it says people's minds were blown by it. And after he tells them this, he goes on to give the people six examples of how the Torah will now look different. Out of the 613 laws, he pinpoints six. And he says, this is how my new kingdom is going to come and take over the Torah. It's as if he takes this deep dive look at the iceberg from underneath the surface. And he says the behavior can be up here above the surface, but now we're going to take a look at what's underneath the surface. In his first example, he says this in chapter 5, verse 21. He says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And we all know that that's the sixth commandment, right? But this is what's changing in verse 22, Jesus says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. In other words, now it's not just about what's happening above the surface. Now it's about what's underneath. It's not about why you murder. He says, now we're going to deal with your anger. In the second example, he says this, starting in verse 27. He says, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. And we all know that that's the seventh commandment, right? But this is what's changing. He reads and he says in verse 28, he says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is saying that in this new kingdom, it's not just about what's happening On the outside, the condition of the heart is imperative. It's not just about being physically faithful to your spouse. It's now about you figuring out what it means to stay mentally and emotionally faithful to them as well. Jesus goes on to talk about divorce, about giving your word, about revenge, about loving your enemies, and more. And he says, this isn't the same old, same old. This is something new. This is different than what you have heard before. God has come into your presence and he is making a shift. And in the verses and in the chapters that follow, Jesus just continues to blow people's minds with his teachings. And if they're willing to listen and to take them to heart, I mean, it will not only change their hearts, but it will also change the world that God has placed them in. Jesus is ushering in this new idea that God cares about more than just your obedience. He cares about your heart. He cares about you. And I'm looking forward to this Sermon on the Mount journey with you 
that we're going to take together. And it's my prayer that God will open up our hearts and maybe even break our hearts by some of the things that we're going to talk about. It's my prayer that the Holy Spirit would use these powerful teachings of Jesus to challenge us with truly what it means when we say yes to following him. Jesus, I want to thank you for your presence with us as we've begun this journey together of studying uh, the Sermon on the Mount, this powerful and sometimes painful and difficult teaching. Jesus, I pray that our hearts would be open and receptive to the, the same kind of troubling change that you might want to bring to us that you did to those that were listening that day. Father, make us receptive to your Holy Spirit's guidance as we move through these important chapters. We ask this in your name.